So let's let's step right into it. Thank you very much indeed, everybody, for um, uh, coming to this talk. I hope the next 50 minutes are going to be uh, worth the time. Um, my name is Ilka Turunen. I'm the field CTO for an organization uh, called Sonotype. Sonotype is a uh, company that is uh, behind a lot of the foundational technology in the most boring part of uh, the Java ecosystem. That's dependency management. In fact, um, in fact, um, you know us from such smash hits as the Nexus Repository Manager. Um, we also run the Maven Central uh, Registry. So, in our in our day to day jobs, uh, we look after one of the largest open source ecosystems uh, in the world. In fact, Maven Central is only this uh, only uh, dwarfed by npm JS because they went all functional with their packages, and it's all a bit of a bleep uh, uh, type of uh, situation for them. So. So um, um, we're an organization. As an organization, we've existed for about fifteen years now, um, and predominantly we work in the realm of dependency management. So, if you've ever had a broken build because you couldn't resolve a dependency, well, uh, I live and breathe that stuff every day. I look at a stack trace uh, too many times, uh, more or less. So. So, um, and in our sort of commercial existence, we work with uh, organizations. We're a relatively large uh, company. We uh, work globally uh, with, um, you know, pretty much every single organization that you can name to help them understand, identify, and ultimately track and remediate uh, open source dependencies across, you know, 15 different programming languages. So really, the business for us is uh, understanding where open source comes from, how you're using it, what software goes into it, generating S bombs, creating uh, creating uh, resolutions on when something happens. So uh, so um, uh, really, when I say it out loud, it's the world's most boring thing. But open source is fascinating. The dependence, and we've heard about supply chain attacks, and we've heard about you know the cascading uh, supply chain uh, out there in the abstract. But when you really dive into it and you dive into the data, there's all there's uh, both very depressing things that you learn, but there's also some very positive things that can be lifted out of there. And most importantly for me, for an engineering conference, some very important uh, engineering habits that we can all take that will teach us how to be better at uh, the everyday task of dealing with dependency hell. So this talk really is a distillation of some of the research that I've been a part of myself uh, for the last uh, sort of uh, sort of uh, eight years of my life. One of the pieces of foundational research that we produce here at Sonotype is uh, a report that comes out every year. It's called the State of the Software Supply Chain. In in that report, we look at um, uh, just some very basic statistics about open source ecosystems. So if you ever heard of a heard of a stat called, um, you know, 90% uh, of uh, modern applications are open source. That's one of those things that we actually uh, discovered in one of our reports uh, many, many years ago. Um, more recently, though, since 2019, we've also started looking into not just what do the stats tell us about open source, but also how are people on the ground when you're, when you're writing software and programs at scale actually dealing with it? How do they feel about it? What does it mean to be effective at managing uh, dependencies, more or less. Why that's important is that um, the latest one uh, came out last year. It's a, by the way, it's a website. If you want to scan the QR code from the recording, feel feel right free. Um, it's a fascinating deep dive. It, it looks at uh, data of both, you know, what is the supply and demand of open source, but it also looks at what does good mean when we talk about open source, right? Of the face of it. Dependency management should be simple, right? You know, I take a package, it looks good on the website, I pull it in, builds, happy days, right? That's that's the happy path that everybody has on day one. In day 10, something gets a dependency update that has an environmental dependency that then explodes the Docker container and then we're into debugging uh, for at least uh, uh, at least half a sprint more, all of a sudden. So becoming good at dependency management can be a huge uh, efficiency gain in organizations. Of course, if you've been anywhere uh, in this industry over the last sort of three, four years, you've probably started hearing a lot about uh, a lot about supply chain attacks, supply chain incidents, and of course, we were just talking about this before the talk last year uh, uh, in December in uh, 21. Uh, Log for Shell uh, obviously really brought that uh, phenomenon that dependencies, when they're widespread, can have a very, very wide and cascading impact. 
This is something that we've been looking at for many, many years. We've got, unfortunately, comparative examples. And I can tell you right off the bat, lock for shell was an anomaly. It was pretty much business as usual. It's just one, the one that happened to get the publicity because it was ubiquitous enough and there was some other dodgy stuff, including Chinese researchers talking about it on a WeChat uh, a little bit too early. So, so it, was, uh, it was all the makings of a good story. But, but to appreciate open source, first we have to appreciate the scale of how much of it is being consumed every single day. As custodians of Maven Central, we look at this number sort of every uh, day. And for the last 10 years, the amount of downloads from Maven Central has been growing at a steady sort of 30, 40% year on year rate. So last year, at the end of the year, we served over 820 billion, that's nine zeros at the end, uh, components from Maven Central. The year before, it was just over 400 billion, 400 and some billion. The year before, it was 200 billion. When I first started at Sonotype, we were talking about tens of millions of dependencies. It's not a unique phenomenon to Java. If you look at the download volume that's occurring in JavaScript, you see the exact same uh, phenomenon as well. As I mentioned very much in the beginning, Java, JavaScript went all functional on their dependencies. So last year, they served over two and a half trillion open source components. And they're growing at the exact same rate as are all the top 10 other open source ecosystems as well. So what's happening is we feel like, hey, open source is every day for us, right? You know, it's just a part of, you know, how we write software. Well, the reality is we as a world, thanks to all the emerging technology, are writing more software than ever, which increases the demand for open source, which unfortunately, inversely, also increases the risks of not managing it once it's in the software. It's very easy to get into it, but anyone who's ever been doing work on technical debt knows that um, you're going to have to uh, come back to it eventually, right? And everything decays over time. So the reality is the supply of open source continues to accelerate, right? Uh, it's not just download volume, but the actual production, people picking up their hands, getting onto the keyboards, and starting to write new projects. In 2021, we saw over uh, 720,000 new open source projects emerge compared to the year previous. Last year, it was well over a million. Um, uh, when you look at the growth rate of projects be being put out there, uh, it's over uh, 20%. Every single year, there's 20% more open source projects than the year previous. So not only are we downloading more of it, there's actually generally more of it available. The average open source project and the dependency puts out 10 releases a year. That's quite a lot of volume when you start thinking about, uh, thinking about uh, how many packages you might have in, a, in that dependency manifest in a POM XML. It is uh, quite a lot also in terms of accrual of uh, technical debt uh, over time. So the reality is Downloading that volume of open source, the average Java application today has about 150 uh, dependencies in it. They're not all direct dependencies. They are dependencies that you download yourself. They have their own dependencies. They download other packages. When you have polyglot languages, you probably have an Angular front end. That's 300 packages off the bat. Uh, and then whatever you add on top probably cascades into it as well. So, uh, so um, uh, with that volume of sort of shared code between your software and your software and your software and your software, you can start, see, start to see that it becomes an attractive target also for bad actors to, uh, uh, to our target, right? That's why organizations have come out over the last sort of decade or so um, under the guise of security or open source or, or whatever. But there are different types of uh, threat scenarios out there. The very first uh, threat scenario, and actually what log for shell was characteristic of as well, is just simply finding a previously unknown security vulnerability in a relatively popular piece of open source and then executing an attack against it. Probably the first sort of really high profile version of this actually happened 10 years ago. It was something that targeted struts one uh, back in the day. It was a deserialization issue, I believe, um, or some OSGI plugin uh, thing back in the day. And it was actually one of the first known instances of some, uh, some uh, mass scanning attempts, you know, people trying to find uh, .action pages or whatever uh, on the internet to try and target uh, the security vulnerabilities. It was such a big deal at the time that the FBI actually issued its first ever cyber uh, security vulnerability bulletin against an open source uh, on that because they felt like it could be risky. 
Well, that didn't really have that much impact because at, back then we didn't really care about security vulnerabilities. 2014, nine years ago, changed that a lot. Those of us that remember, uh, and if you don't, that's fine too, something called Shellshock happened. Shellshock was the first instance of a branded security vulnerability. Somebody not only found a vulnerability, but they found out a way to market that security vulnerability. And it was on the news everywhere for a brief moment. It was an open SSL bug, essentially, that uh, you know it was a 10 out of 10. It was pretty bad, easy to exploit. Uh, all the makings of a bad situation. So so it really got quite a lot of attention, but because it was really on the OpenSSL package, primarily the attention was sent into the DevOps floor, not necessarily onto the development floor. Well, over the years, we saw instances of other security vulnerabilities that started getting exploited. Uh, in 2015, there was a security vulnerability that affected a component called Commons Collections. Very, very common because it's a part of the Commons package. Um, Commons Collections is a deserializer. And what you can do with that is uh, it's often used in interfaces. It's all used in CLIs, you know, when components communicate with each other or when you upload stuff. And unfortunately, people realized there was an exploit called Why So Serial, uh, which was a, you know, remember when The Dark Knight was cool as a movie back then? Uh, um uh, it, was a, it was a sort of serial toolkit where you could essentially generate a payload. If you just found an interface on, the, on a website, you could just send that payload in and the application would execute uh, the code um, that you wanted. So, yeah, sounds like a pretty standard uh, security vulnerability, right? The reason why I highlight Commons Collections is because it was the first known security vulnerability that physically cost lives. Because it turns out there's a, ho a hospital uh, in the US. It's called the Hollywood Presbyterian uh, Hospital. It ran all of its patient systems based on some ancient version of uh, Java. And there was a ransomware uh, campaign that was executed using this Commons Collection security vulnerability. That ransomware uh, attack shut their hospital systems down for a day. And they actually made a decision to shut the hospital down itself, redirecting all ambulances. It's estimated that at least two patients didn't make it because when you're having a cardiac arrest, minutes matter, right? If you get redirected to another hospital in a major city, it's a problem. So I say this not to tug on your heartstrings, but just to say that this stuff really does matter. And it's a lot closer than just you know, somebody putting in a crypto miner. That's the fun stuff. That's the funny stuff that we write articles about. But the software that we write ends up in very serious applications. And if you, if these uh, dependencies are not managed properly, they produce some very serious um, surfaces uh, for that application uh, to be exploited against. So then we come to Lock for Shell. Lock for Shell is actually a characteristic security vulnerability. It is just a known security deficiency uh, in a in a relatively popular component. We were talking about this earlier, like that Lock for Shell is the most published on security vulnerability of all time, as said by the director of the United States Cybersecurity Agency. It was on the news. I think even my mother-in-law asked me on dinner uh, during dinner what this Lock for Shell thing is. Um, it is a security vulnerability that was really bad. I don't think I need to explain to you why it was bad. But what's depressing is that this is the download graph of downloads of log for shell from Maven Central over time as the vulnerability happened. Everything colored red is vulnerable to log for shell Everything colored other, uh, other colors is another version of log for shell that's patched to at least some degree to the major security vulnerability. So it was discovered on December 10th, which is this day here. So on that day, you see almost an immediate jump to sort of 40% of all downloads of log for shell uh, being to a patched version. In a couple of days, that peaks up to about 60%. And guess what happens in the first three months after that? The trend barely moves from there. In fact, we, I looked at this last week, today, 27% of all downloads for uh, Log4j are still vulnerable to Log4Shell. 27%, nearly a third of every download uh, that occurs for Log4j still downloads that uh, vulnerable version of that component. You might ask a very reasonable question. Well, why is that? Well, it's because People just probably don't even know that it's there. It's probably because they have a transitive dependency chain that's very long. It's probably because they don't care. The problem with security vulnerabilities is it's not a functional issue. 
It's just like somebody figuring out that, hey, the windows are shut, but there's no locks on the window, so I can just open them up. That's fundamentally what they are. It doesn't break anything functionally. So as organizations, unless something bad happens, we don't have an incentive to fix it because the software is working as intended. It just has a side effect, right? So the reason why these security vulnerabilities get so much attention is that uh, ignorance, right? Because it's not the silent killer of tomorrow's next big security vulnerability that gets us. It's the fact that today still the number one most exploited security vulnerability by nation state actors and other hacking groups tends to be the slightly older high profile security vulnerabilities that just haven't been touched because people just don't know about them. Very quickly, when the security vulnerability came out, um, in December, the US already started alerting uh, through their intelligence channels that known uh, advanced uh, uh, threat groups are starting to exploit that security vulnerability. And uh, in October of last year, the FBI and you know some of the other security agencies um, in the US a year, almost a year after the actual security vulnerability had occurred, all the publicity had happened, all the patching efforts had happened, they released a list that said, here are the top CVEs actively exploited by uh, state-sponsored actors. And guess what's number one? It's log for shell because 30% of every download of log for shell is still vulnerable. So it's an excellent target from them to, them to go after. Time heals all wounds, but time also makes you forget about tech debt, uh, which dependency management is a part of. So it, uh, it, it creates this sort of situation where um, it's extremely useful for these threat actors, right? Software also usually runs in privileged environments, so it's very easy to see why people want to, uh, want to go after it. So this pattern of behavior, it's been out there since time immemorial. Security vulnerabilities exist. We have Patch Tuesday for that exact reason. But what's special about a supply chain and dependency management in software is that uh, it's very ubiquitous. So very quickly, the attackers actually realized that uh, I don't have to wait for some security researchers to come out and figure out a security vulnerability. I could just make one. So in 2017, here's a sort of sad story to tell. 2017, um, a credentials list was leaked uh, that gave out credentials to nearly 80,000 NPM packages uh, on GitHub. So somebody had gone into NPMJS, managed to hack it, get some, got some weak credentials out there through credential stuffing, and put that list out there. So uh, some attackers got inspired by this uh, incident and realized that, hey, if I go after uh, some NPM packages, I can probably, they have millions of downloads a week very easily, so I can probably get my thing uh, cascaded. So within weeks of that, we started seeing various different types of modes of attack uh, in 2017. This was, the, this was the year, six years ago. We started seeing people exploiting different tactics, uh, tactics against it. Maybe Central is what I'd call a identity-secured uh, open source repository. In order to publish to Maven Central, you have to open a ticket, you have to prove your identity, put a DNS record or whatever. You have to own the FQDN, essentially, to be able to publish. In many other open source ecosystems, out of design, they don't require any verification at all. So people realized that, hey, actually, easiest thing to do, let me just type up a very popular package name. Instead of colors.js, I can do colors.js or something like that, use an S instead of a Z. When a million developers type on a million keyboards, eventually somebody makes a typo. And most of package installs are just typing the package name into an install or a package manifest, right? So they realized that actually, if I put a typo squatted version of, of a package out there, even if it lives for a day or two, that's easily 100,000 installs of my crypto miner onto a machine, which you know is actual profit. Um, we started seeing uh, similar attacks occurring in Python. And over the years, unfortunately, in the beginning, we, I kept a sort of list of everything that kind of happened. Um, you know, Every time we like, document an incident or we find a new story, we kept it pu putting it on the list. I stopped in July 2021. You don't even have to read all of this because there's a lot of, lot of this stuff. Uh, July 2021, I stopped because the volume was too much. And unfortunately, it has just kept growing and growing and growing from there. The latest and probably the thing that should cause us the most alarm evolution uh, uh, is that they realized that it's not only just enough to drop you know, some sort of backdoor onto a machine that downloads the package, Developers have privileged machines, and development infrastructure is both designed to run on high CPU, high RAM, high network, so it's the perfect place to do a lot of shady shit, right? 
Also, they've realized that uh, development infrastructure is where you can go and poison a software and then get it to be built and signed with authentic certificates. Because if you can modify the CI build and inject some of your own code, it passes off as legitimate. You know, VirusTotal isn't going to complain about it because it's got a legitimate signature. Happy days. So, um, so uh, that's exactly what happened. Um, initially, sort of in the, in the old days of the 2010s, we started seeing this first uh, through people using that Commons Collection security vulnerability in Jenkins. Jenkins has a CLI. Back then, it used uh, a serialized interface to communicate with the main Jenkins server. So you could literally just find a public Jenkins URL. If you've ever heard of a website called showdown.io, you can search for web servers using that. Literally just type in Jenkins and you find like 100,000 publicly available Jenkinses. All of them were vulnerable to this attack. So uh, script kiddies do what script kiddies do, and they mine some crypto. In fact, they got away with over $3 million worth of uh, cryptocurrency uh, at that time's rate. Um, it's probably worth seven pounds, five pounds, 50 million pounds uh, to the, in today's money, um, more or less, right? Um, but we've seen variations of this attack continue to this day. The reason why it happens, nobody actually really maintains their CI services. When's the last time that you took it down and updated it, right? Um, and nobody really cares um, uh, cares about high CPU or high RAM. Those canaries don't matter in a CI server because they're designed to run builds all the time and you actually want to run them hot uh, as much as you can, right? So the main uh, thing to see here is that your uh, de de development infrastructure is becoming an issue. From there, we started seeing much more deadlier attacks occurring. There was a lesser publicized cybersecurity incident a couple of years ago called CodeCov. It's, it's an organization that produces uh, um, uh, security, uh, uh, software security scanners. Essentially, it's a static code analyzer. You put it into your GitHub action or whatever, it's a little shell script, analyzes your code, gives you some shell, gives you uh, static code analysis results back. Well, somebody infiltrated their CI and uh, injected that uh, malware, injected that CLI scanner with extra code that not only sent the code to be analyzed to CodeCov, it also sent it to a third, uh, a third server somewhere in the internet, which turned out to be in Russia somewhere. That affected over 200,000 uh, users at least. So that source code is now out there. Other known incidents of this type of attack, uh, if you remember a few years ago, there was a major hack against Ticketmaster and British Airways. Their payment portals were uh, compromised. Well, that happened because somebody injected extra lines of code at an end of a JavaScript file that was loaded on the payment processing page. And that extra line of code just skimmed the, skimmed the uh, form fields and uh, sent it off to a third party uh, when the payment pro uh, transaction happened. That was live for at least three weeks. Many of us had to uh, re-roll our credit cards if you flew at that time. So it's it's a known vector. Of course, probably the most known uh, attack of this type is a so supply chain incident known as uh, SolarWind. SolarWind, again, you know, enterprise uh, security technology, somebody infiltrated their uh, CI services and added an extra DLL. Uh, onto the software. It's Windows software, so you know it's a DLL. That DLL got signed with official certificates because it's coming through the official trusted CI service. And what then ends up happening is customers install that update. Now that DLL then dynamically loads a Trojan and off you pop. Uh, you're, you're screwed. Uh, unfortunately, that type of attack is even more common uh, than we think. You know, just a few weeks ago, there was a new incident with an organization called FreeCX. They sell IP telephone software, basically. Over here, I guess the um, equivalent is Ring Central um, or, or any any one of these IP phone softwares. It they poison or Avira antivirus also had a very similar incident. They poison a DLL or poison a component that's already there with additional code, or they add an extra transitive dependency onto the mix that gets pulled in. It all looks legitimate, but when it hits the uh, hits the uh, target, it then uh, create it drops the payload and creates the uh, incident. So. It's very, very dark times, and unfortunately, we're seeing all variations of this. My favorite one is probably something called Octopus Scanner. It's essentially a security vulnerability that targets IDEs. It installs an IDE plugin that then, uh, when you run uh, a build, I think it was for a clip against Eclipse, when you run a build, it actually injects that build with their own code at the end. So every time you run a local build, uh, it just uh, poisons the software as well. And it's also self-propagating, so it tries to find other Eclipse instances in your network and uh, poison them too. 
So, um, yeah. It turns out, you know, all those admin rights that we have, yeah, they're, uh, they're, they're a problem. There's an issue. So, um, that's not all either. There's other simpler forms of attack. If you take one lesson from this talk, learn about a supply chain method called dependency confusion. Dependency confusion is more popular in JavaScript. It exists in other programming languages, not so much in Java, because uh, we have strict namespace protection here. But uh, in other programming languages, like I said earlier, in any open source ecosystem, anyone can register any name, right? So let's assume you go to GitHub, you find your company uh, that you want to target, just go through their public open source repos, right? Look at their package manifest. Who, who, how many of us have tried to like build something from some, some bank's open source registry and then you realize that it fails because you, you're missing a dependency that's in a private registry? Well, with dependency confusion, that's exactly what you're looking for. You take the name of that package, you go to npmjs or PyPy or whatever, you register that same package name because they also have flat coordinates or used to have flat coordinates. Um, you register the same package name but now you publish version 999. Most builds probably just ask for the latest version. So now you can have a completely illegitimate, illegitimate package that is pulled in again by the official CI service that drops a payload. What's uh, deadly about dependency confusion is dead simple to do. Anyone can do it. You can literally, uh, literally go and do it right now if you wanted to. It's still not a fixed avenue. It was uh, described by a Romanian security researcher by the name of Alex Bursan. He wrote a very famous uh, blog post about it um, in uh, 2020. And within days, 72 hours in, uh, we started tracking over 300 copycats. Within a week, we'd seen thousands. And right now, we estimate that out of the supply chain attacks that I, I will mention, almost 80% of them are dependency confusion types or inspired types. It's easy because it's targeted against a specific organization, but um, but it's something that um, uh, you know requires no skill whatsoever uh, to uh, produce, uh, etc. So almost immediately we start seeing all the big names being targeted against these types of attacks, and it's not just the big names. Any organization with sort of any any sort of credence has at this point been a target of this, and we have actually we published this list of hey this month we found these attacks and we took them down. We've had several. Uh, incidents uh, where people actually call us because we publish a blog post and say, hey, we found a dependency confusion type attack against company X, Y, and Z. They call us and say, what are you calling us malicious for? You know, we got this from an InfoSec vendor that said that, uh, you know, you're saying that our software is malicious. Our customers are asking questions. It's like, no, dude, we protected you against the security incident and you're complaining to me about it. Thanks. Love this industry. Oh, it's great. So we actually do some research about this, right? Um, and one of the most depressing things that we looked at well, uh, two years ago was how easy would it be to cover as many developers as you can? It turns out you only need to affect the 100 most popular NPM packages and you're going to be covering uh, nearly 90% of the 60% of the entire uh, dependency, entire NPM world. Because 100 packages tend to be transitive dependencies. The 100 most popular packages in NPM tend to be transitive dependencies of other packages, right? You know, the commons collections of their world tend to always be the utilities or log for js of their world tend to be utilities in other projects. And this graph pretty much uh, affects affects uh, every single other ecosystem as well. So technically, if you found a way of uh, spoofing or uh, affecting five to 10 of the most popular open source projects in every ecosystem, you'd probably cover 60% of the entire world um, of software with those packages alone. Pretty st chilling stuff, eh? I hope so, because it is to me, and I look at this every day. So let's talk about one final thing. So I, I said that this sort of manufacturing of the security vulnerability is an increasing trend, but I don't think you realize how much it is increasing. So when we the first year that we ran these numbers, when we first started seeing these e simple typo squatting attacks, we documented 216. That's a nice number. The next year, uh, we had documented uh, just over 1,000. Or put it in statistics, nearly a 430% annual increase. Great, great on a press release, by the way. Um, that's a huge increase. The following year, this chart is going to get really boring because they just start looking the same. Following year, that had tenfolded. So we had found that found over 12,000 packages 
That, uh, uh, my friends, is over 650% annual increase of known and documented versions of these uh, types of attacks. And I hate to break it to you, but uh, last year we ran the numbers again. They're nearly 100, 000, they're over 100,000 uh, when I ran the numbers uh, last month. So to this date, we have documented over 115,000 known instances of this type of attack, which averages out over these three years that we've been really cataloging this uh, in all seriousness to a humble 742% average annual growth. It's pretty depressing. In fact, the UK government is writing laws against this, and that's the first stat that they cited about it. If you're hearing about supply chain attacks and you're hearing about why software supply chain matters, this stat is the reason. It's because it's happening, and it's happening fast, and that means that anyone that has a, a series of dependencies in their software has to do something about it, or at least know what's there. So let's talk about what can we do. I still have 20 minutes. Great. You know, we can dive deep into this stuff. Uh, don't worry at all. Well, look, when we talk about this, uh, when we talk about what should be done about this, probably the first uh, piece of uh, discourse that you see in the press is, hey, lock for j is a project run by free people. Uh, those free people probably don't have funding. They work out of a garage. They eat noodles for lunch. Uh, poor them, right? Or hey, you know, the government needs to needs to step up and provide funding for open source. And uh, hey, by the way, organizations, you know, the big banks in the world, they should also contribute back to open source. And um, and uh, hey, the internet runs on open source. Open SSL is open source. Who pays for it? All of these sort of um, you know funny uh, uh, articles start cropping up in in, in sort of more uh, business oriented media very very quickly. The reality is we totally should do that, right? We should fund our open source maintainers. It's a tough job. We should definitely give them support. We should absolutely find ways for governments and organizations to help. And every single one of us needs to pick up a shovel, even if it's just for documentation, because that helps, right? But the reality is that that is not the problem. The, uh, there's two sides to open source risk and risk of security vulnerability. First of all, are the people writing the code producing secure enough code and making right choices about the dependencies? And then there's the consumption side. That's us, by the way. If you've ever done an NPN install, installer, congratulations, you're a consumer. Um, that consumption side um, the consumption side means uh, means anyone making a decision, downloading uh, downloading style, uh, downloading dependencies. So look, when this conversation happens, everybody always defaults to open source is the problem, right? Open source is risky. There is so much, uh, there is so many unknown security vulnerabilities. It's just a time bomb. You know, there's so, too much open source. We should find ways of controlling it. No. The reality is that there's some truth to the fact 35% of every release in Meme Central contains some known security vulnerability, known and documented security vulnerability. That's a third. That's a lot. Um, there's almost three and a half million vulnerable releases out there in the year. And you know when we tally up every known security vulnerability, every download uh, that has a known and documented security vulnerability, that's over a billion downloads a year that somebody has chosen to download uh, security vulnerabilities. So yes. There is risky open source out there, but the reality of the situation is open source by and large outclasses every single enterprise development team in terms of speed of response for security. 96% of all the, document, all the documented and known security vulnerabilities have a better version out there. Oh, look for Shell. The, the vulnerability that ended the world that was uh, so bad uh, that had the free poor maintainers, they created a fix in two weeks on their spare time. That's amazing to the world's largest uh, security vulnerability. That's brilliant, right? Open source is by far the best, uh, best organization, best type of uh, way of creating security, uh, security fixes because people see the code, they can suggest fixes, there's more procreation of ide proliferation of ideas. It's the perfect match, right? And even more so, uh, on the consumption side, you know, when you ask this to people and you have this conversation, you go, well, hey, how are you doing with your open source? You've been thinking about it. You've been thinking about it. Hey, we've been hearing about the supply chain thing. You've gotten pretty good at it, right? You've made sure to um, check your dependencies and you pinned your versions and all that stuff, right? Well, data suggests, it supports that perception. When we survey people, every year in this report, we survey people and we ask them, hey, 
How, how are you doing? Do you have practices for open source? Are you fixing vulnerabilities when you find them? Are you actually addressing the security vulnerabilities that come in uh, through these scanners? 68%, yeah, we're pretty good. Actually, uh, we're doing all right. We're, we're doing a great job here. Um, and especially what peaks in maturity is people say, you're very good at fixing bugs. Like when we get a security vulnerability, we have a very robust uh, maturity, mature remediation program. It's, these are basically the histograms of, of various questions that we ask. And really, remediation of security vulnerabilities is what people really peak into the right. Kind of funny enough, that's not really what happens when you look at the raw data. Um, Funny enough, when you look at those same survey respondents and you actually audit applications that they are uh, that they scan, 68% of the applications surveyed have a known and documented security vulnerability. Even more so, pointy here managers any, anyone? I'm I'm one. Uh, uh, managers tend to uh, overestimate their maturity of security stance by over three and a half times. So we're just talking about this, like, hey, developers knew about this all along but the business didn't care. Well, guess what? The data suggests that that assumption is exactly true. Um, the organization and the management in the organization tends to overestimate their ability to deal with security risk, but the actual situation is that 38% of every single download of log for shell the most popular security vulnerability out there, is still to the vulnerable version. So let's talk about, uh, talk about this stuff. Um, publicity does matter, and it's not quite as bad of a picture. When we look at some of the enterprise research set that was made available for us uh, in this research, we looked at three similar security vulnerabilities. One of them was Log for Shell, and one of them was Spring for Shell, and one of them is an unnamed security vulnerability of equal uh, equal uh, uh, impact uh, over time. So what these graphs illustrate, these are enterprise customers with actual processes. So what these graphs illustrate is the fixed adoption over time. Good news, log for shell nearly a hundred percent fixed rate after about fifteen days uh, of the security vulnerability coming down. It goes very quickly in about uh, weeks time working weeks time, people adopt the fix and and in in uh, enterprise organizations, they tend to actually stick with the fix. That's good news. But that's because it was on the news, and the people that work for these organizations are highly paid and they're smart and they care. Now let's look at Spring for Shell. That's the medium one. That's in uh, that's in Spring. It's a it was a momentary. It wasn't quite as bad, but it's still pretty bad security vulnerability. Well, when we ran the data set, uh, 20 days after the incident came out, there was a little bit of publicity about it. You know, I think I gave a couple of interviews about it as well. Um, fixed rate adoption somewhere in the 60 percent uh, percentile rate. So 40 percent of all downloads for Spring at that time were still vulnerable to that uh, known security vulnerability in enterprises that have these mature remediation processes. Probably the thing that's closest to the reality of what's actually happening with a lot of these uh, security vulnerabilities is this unnamed popular uh, library that has a known and documented security vulnerability. It only has about a 25% adoption rate for the fix. And that's because it isn't on the news. It's just an alert on whatever security tool you're using. It's just some CVE or just some GitHub issue that comes up and you go, not a priority right now, we'll put it in the middle of the backlog and uh, we'll come back to it uh, when we can. And that never happens or it happens very slowly, right? That's probably the reality of where our practice as engineers is managing dependencies. 20% of these highly mature organizations that are very good at remediation don't <laughs> remediate the rest of them really don't right so the moral of the story here is that is put in in a simple pie chart because i like simple pie charts look most open source out there is actually very secure most of the ones that have security vulnerabilities uh have all fixes available there are newer and better versions out there but on the consumer side most of the downloads that happen right now are to vulnerable versions, and even more so, well, are to vulnerable versions. But even more so, if you think about the amount of work that we have to do to to keep up with this, if, if I'm, I'm talking in the context of a single security vulnerability here, if you think about just this logically, a single Java app has 150 dependencies. Those 150 dependencies have 10 releases a year. That's nearly 1,500 updates to consider 
per project. You probably don't just work in a single project, do you? I hope so. I uh, hope not. Uh, I mean, lucky you if you do. But um, that's the reality of this. That is the mounting silent technical debt that we all have in our applications, in our estates, and in our uh, in our legacy um, uh, legacy software. And that is the reason why we read about these things in the news. So let's talk about how we can be better, right? You know, it's not all doom and gloom. Turns out there's some very simple rules of thumb, uh, including you can just buy a solution. But um, uh, but um, in, in in practice, there are engineering habits that we can distill. Uh, from uh, all of this data. So, this final part of this presentation is about what are, can I do to pick better components. Uh, and in better, in this case, is has less security vulnerability than the previous version. Well, there are frameworks out there. There's something called the OpenSSF Security Scorecard. OpenSSF, or the Open Source Software Security Foundation, is a foundation uh, that's under the Linux Foundation. It was It's one of the uh, NGOs that's formed by industrial bodies. It's got the Googles and the Microsofts. We are also on the board. Um, and this is the organization that consults, for example, the Americans when they write laws about this stuff. They have a scorecard, and that scorecard has many attributes of what we would consider intuitively good uh, security practices. Make sure that you have a security policy. Make sure you have an update policy. Make sure that you're, you make sure that you have workflow permissions. Make sure that you fast test your stuff. Make sure that you don't have any known security vulnerabilities. Make sure that you do all this patching that I'm, I'm, I'm telling you to do. Well, one of the things that uh, we tried that last year is, hey, if we take those attributes and we feed it into a not an LLM, but just the neural network, and we say predict if there are security vulnerabilities in projects that exhibit these behaviors. Um, we thought that maybe we can predict security vulnerabilities. Well, it turns out, yeah, it's, it's pretty good. It turns out uh, if you run open source projects through that security prediction, 80% uh, of them have a known security vulnerability. But it, the interesting finding is this, uh, is we actually looked at what indicator is the most important ones for in implicating that security vulnerabilities uh, uh, don't exist. So basically, think about this as, here are the practices that you could adopt. Where do I start? What has the highest return on investment? Well, it turns out, by far, the highest return on investment is having a code review process. That had the biggest correlation for a secure project. Kind of obvious, isn't it, when you say it out loud? But it's interesting to see it in data. Interesting also to see uh, if they had no uh, unknown binaries in their software. That was a high uh, implication. If they pinned the versions of their dependencies, that was also a very high, uh, uh, high indicator of security success. And finally, branch protection, which protects you against these open source injection attacks, like somebody submits a malicious PR onto your project and does something untoward. Kind of an obvious thing to say out loud, but it's really interesting to see it reflected in data. Also, the inverse of this is that fuzzing had nearly no impact. Workflow patterns had nearly no impact. Having a security policy, unsurprisingly, also had no impact. Because who's ever read a security policy and actually remembers it? I don't, and I work in security, right? That's, that's the reality. Written documentation doesn't help uh, when, we, when we talk about, uh, uh, talk about this uh, stuff. So... Let's talk about how we can apply this. What can we do in order to deal with this? Well, one of the things that we did as custodians of Maven Central is we took the model and we actually produced something we call, uh, we added to that model um, another indicator that we use in our own products. We call it the mean time to upgrade. Mean time to upgrade is a very simple metric that you can calculate on your dependencies and on your own projects. It's this, when you have a project and it has a new security vulnerability in its dependencies, and that dependency then gets a patch. How quickly does the project uh, apply that fix? The average MTTU of uh, most open source projects today is about 60 days. Could be better, but that's what it is. It turns out MTTU is a great indicator of project health because it actually indicates the habits that the project puts in to maintain its and manage its technical debt. Um, it turns out that if you put time and energy and effort into maintaining those dependency chains, you're also actually probably putting time, energy, and effort into maintaining the rest of your code, which means that your project on large is much more secure. So when we mix that indicator in, we come up with the Sonotype safety rating. So if you go to Maven Central search today, 
some projects will already have this publicly available. You'll see it today. We made it uh, free to access because we think that it's a very important thing um, uh, for you to see. The Sunlight Security Rating is actually 96% uh, 86% accurate, not, not quite 90 uh, I can't remember all my stats, but it's 86% accurate uh, at predicting a presence of security vulnerability. It isn't meant to say that project is better than the other project. You can still have a good project with a low security rating. It just means that the likelihood of a security vulnerability appearing to it is increased. So, hey, happy days. Simple number. Is it 10 out of 10? You're better off than uh, if it's a 1 out of 10, right? But there are uh, other ways that you can do uh, to uh, deal with this. So when we distill all of these learnings out, on the production side, do all of the things that they tell you to do. Get more funding, get more help, implement these best practices, especially code review. If you produce any code and you share it as open source, absolutely do all of those things. Maybe don't start with fuzzing. That's probably the other lesson. As consumers, though, that's where most of this risk is realized. The reason why supply chain attacks are so uh, bad and uh, so prominent is because we as developers make bad choices. There's no other way of saying it. So we have got to learn to make better choices and put time aside to use those choices, right? So on the consumption side, first of all, maybe think about what dependencies you're putting, like really think about what dependencies you're putting in. You can use the safety rating as, a, as an indicator. If it's a high safety rating, go for that over some other version. Another easy question to ask yourself is, if I look at five projects in this company, why do I find five separate logging frameworks or loggers in there? Why can't we just standardize on one? Well, I know why we can't, because we like arguing and we all have opinions. But the reality is, if we're doing this at scale, unfortunately, we have to set some standards. And if we want to do this efficiently, we have to get there. The reality also is, you know, the average project's 150 dependencies in Java. If you have a Java, JS frontend or whatever, that just quadruples, quadruples. The reality is you need tooling, and there's no way around it. There's open source tooling out there. There's also commercial tooling out there that helps you with this. But you have got to implement something because there's no way any single engineer can keep up with all the updates. That would be several full-time jobs. In fact, we, we ran the maths. And we found out that if people were very efficient using an automation, they would probably send at least, save at least two and a half working weeks every year in efficiency because uh, they wouldn't be dealing with dependency hell all the time. Um, and look, you know, the first step to admitting that you have a problem is to truly look in the organization and understand the scale of the problem. I bet you, you will be slightly disappointed at first because it is usually quite monumental. But uh, the good news is organizations will start getting incentive. Laws are coming. Uh, in fact, the European Union, the Americans, and the British government, to their uh, credit, are all preparing various different types of legislation that will mandate some steps uh, for us to take in order, uh, in order for us to, um, uh, to be better at these practices. I'm not going to bore you with the legal text. Probably the most advanced one is the, uh, is the uh, Executive Order for the Nation's Cybersecurity and the uh, recently published uh, National Cybersecurity Strategy in the US. In the European Union, it's the Cyber Resilience Act. It's a directive. It's coming. Uh, it's in the second reading right now. You can still give some feedback. Thieves have some very problematic uh, sentences. Right now, for example, the Cyber Resilience Act uh, has a stanza that's, uh, that could potentially make any open source developer liable for security vulnerabilities in their code, which is a completely ridiculous thing to say, but uh, that's what it is. What they all have a key uh, theme on, though, this is the American one, but it's the same in, in all of these, is essentially a call for liability, personal liability for cybersecurity vulnerabilities. What they all say in their own words is, if I choose to download open source from the internet, I put it in my software, and then I sell it to you, and you get hacked for it. I am no, normally what would happen in today's law is we sign a contract, and in that ULA it says, by the way, you can't really sue me. If you get hacked, you get hacked, apply the security patches, that's that. But uh, under this new law, they would say that doesn't apply anymore. You can still sue me for uh, vulnerable code um, if I didn't provide you with you know, certain levels of assurances. One of those assurances is a document called the Software Bill of Materials, which is just a list of all your dependencies and everything that's in there. 
So, uh, there's a telling statement in one of the laws. I'm not going to read this to you. It basically says, if you don't have a minimum level of security practices relating to dependencies, the law is uh, not on your side. Essentially, what the all the governments of the world are saying, the Americans will be first, Europe probably next few years, will say that uh, you have to have a minimum level of evidence of your software, uh, uh, software security stance or otherwise this could happen to you, this role play that we just did there. So hey, here's the commercial shill. We do sell software that helps with us. We have a standout there. Talk to me afterwards. I think we're at time right now. So thank you very much, everyone.